sure you would have seen yesterday the entire day we were discussing on energy uh, and everyone were very extremely happy with the last session of, oh, of the day it was extremely though it short the time over short the time uh, we just didn't want to cut the time <laughs> cut the session because of your participation and today the entire day we'll be discussing about say, space uh, so we'll start with uh, uh, dr goel's uh, initial uh, remark on space on space and uh, today in the afternoon uh, you will be interacting with uh, uh, the strategic and security studies program like you did with the energy and uh, environmental program yesterday uh, followed by there is a set of uh, report releases that is in the evening after tea uh, by the same program uh, so the entire day will be discussing with uh, space and i am grateful to uh, dr goel for finding time to be with us uh, this is a workshop that we have been holding for the last many years. I'm sure you would have been a part of some of this uh, program earlier, uh, Dr. Goyal. And this one is uh, the focus is on science and uh, science policy and uh, uh, science policy and general management. Uh, we have a set of uh, uh, senior scientists from all over the labs, all the labs, all across the country. And this is the fourth day. The first day we discussed nuclear energy. Uh, second day we discussed other forms of energy. Today we are looking into space. Uh, so you'll, you are the opening batsman for the day on uh, on space. And we have Dr. Aparao uh, chairing your session. Over to you, Dr. Aparao. Thank you very much. Good morning <coughs> to all of you. I feel it's a great uh, honor for me to be the, for sharing this uh, morning session. Not only that, for introducing uh, the most eminent uh, speaker for this session, Dr. P. S. Goyal, sir. Dr. P. S. Goyal was born on, you know, the year which the country uh, got independence. So, 1947, in a village, Dabarasi, district, Morabad, Uttar Pradesh. He did his B.E. in electrical engineering from University of Jodhpur, M.E. in applied electronics and servo mechanisms from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and PhD from Bangalore University. Later on, he started his career with initiating activity on satellite altitude control systems, first spinning RS-1 satellite at Trivandrum, and later moved to Bangalore as part of Aryabhatta project team. He developed spin axis orientation system, Bhaskara 1 and 2 satellites, magnetic control for spinning satellites, momentum bias, three axis control systems for Apple, zero momentum biased three axis control systems for IRS, fifth configuration momentum biased altitude control system for highly stabilized INSAT 2. He developed very agile control system with steep, with step and stairs capability to spot imaging mission, TES and guided the evolution of re-entry capability of SRE mission. Dr. Goyal immensely contributed to the development of magnetic altitude control system, mission planning for remote sensing, communication, and scientific mission, and authored over 100 research papers in referred journals and conferences. Dr. Goyal was the chairman spacecraft system advisory board for IRS-1, project engineer AOCS for Apple, and associate professor director in SAT-2. He was head control system division Group Director AOCS, Deputy Director Mission and Control Area, Associate Director of ISAC, and he was the Director, Indian Space Research Organization Satellite Center from 1997 to 2005. Dr. Goel subsequently moved to Delhi as the Secretary, Department of Ocean Development and transformed it into Ministry of Earth Sciences by integrating ocean, atmosphere, and geosciences and technologies. He was the first chairman of Earth Commission. He oversaw commissioning of Tsunami Warning System of India, initiated the modernization of IMD and pursued the exploration of deep oceans. Dr. Goyal was the chairman, recruitment and assessment center, defense research and development organization, and member of National Security Advisory Board. He was president of Indian National Academy of Engineering and Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, Distinguished Professor of Indian Space Research Organization. 
he was drdo chair at research center imarath drdo hyderabad where large number of drdo laboratories are uh, situated there and pursuing space for national security dr goel was awarded padma shri in 2001 he received several other awards including lifetime achievement award of aeronautical society of india and distinguished scientist award of isro is the fellow of indian academy of sciences bangalore national academy of sciences allahabad indian national science academy new delhi institution of electronic and uh, telecommunication engineers new delhi aeronautical society of india bangalore and third world academy of sciences he is honorary fellow electrochemical society of india bangalore and in of technology mumbai he is also a member international academy of aeronautic and paris currently dr goel is honorary distinguished professor at isro headquarters bangalore he is also chairing technology research board trb ministry of earth sciences so with this brief introduction now may request dr goel sir to please uh, deliver your talk Dr. Baldev Raj, Dr. Aparav, Dr. Aparav, thank you very much for nice words. Friends from uh, cream of India, you, I can say, or organizations you represent, uh, very senior uh, level people. It's pleasure to be here, and I must thank Dr. Baldev Raj uh, for giving this uh, opportunity to share some thoughts. the topic was given by the organizers science technology in space applications and challenges i was wondering what i really uh, should be talking about i realized that uh, there was no talk before on space as such so i thought uh, i will have to start somewhere from the beginning in terms of space giving some introduction but my focus would be more on emerging applications and challenges space has the advantage that the satellite looks uh, is at the top in a lower earth orbit you are talking of 500 km to 1000 km and uh, in a geosynchronous satellite you are talking 36000 km So when you look from the top, you get a synoptic view. Of course, what you can look at it depends on the instrumentation. It's possible to make use of very large spectrum of the electromagnetic waves, starting from high frequency to the light, and that gives uh, a lot of uh, information. when we start looking at things in different spectrums of course as you know we are benefited by the communication capability um, using satellite as a reflector as a just a dish and of course we amplify the signals and them back the other important uh, application has been the navigation using gps it has revolutionized uh, the uh, location and we know where we are very precisely and we'll discuss some things about this uh, of course uh, on the space exploration we have a uh, lot of telescopes on ground but they have a limitation because the atmosphere is not all that uh, i would say transparent it gives a lot of distortions so once you put a telescope like hubble in space it increases the capability and today we are able to see through these telescopes billions of lights years away however coming to the space program of india is basically uh, three things the launch vehicles the satellites and applications i am sure you many of us have seen this slide this is put it for a sake of uh, completion the 
two elements of the communication of the applications are the satellite communication and the earth observation and of course the navigation which has come out to be very powerful tool in terms of uh, location and various other applications which are getting into uh, remote sensing particularly in terms of uh, atmospheric sciences we'll discuss that part later so just to uh, give you a glimpse of where isro is and these are the uh, elements of the launch vehicle just thought of telling you that today we don't have slv3 and psl slv they are uh, long back left but pslv is one of the success story of india we have 33 launches without any failure which itself is a very big uh, feat in uh, our kitty in our uh, so something to be proud of it has a capability of launching up to 1700 kg in uh, polar synchronous orbit and about uh, 1100 kg into the gto next is uh, gslv we sometimes call it mark 2 in that mark 1 was with the russian uh, crack upper stage mark 2 with indian upper stage we had total nine flights and one successful flight with the operational flight with the indian crash stage and what is emerging is the mark 3 this will have a while well, jslv has the capability to launch 2500 kg into the gto the mark 3 will have uh, somewhere around 4 ton into the gto and then there are various versions of the mark 3 which can take it to five ton and also uh, there's a new technology isro is working on new for us not for the world otherwise the 60s technology semi cryogenic once that comes up in next uh, i would say about 6 to 7 years then we will have a capability of the mark 3 to go up to 6 to 6 and half in fact projections are we can achieve even 7 and half ton and once we achieve this mark 3 then we will be able to do lot more than just applications actually we don't need this capability for using the space for our applications that i think 5 ton 5 and half ton is more than enough but if you want to get uh, into space for example you want to have a space station you want to have man in uh, orbit the new need of the order of 6 to 7 and half ton capability so that capability will achieve perhaps in uh, maybe if the cryogenic stage is available and other developments fall through 7 to 8 years so we are doing very well in terms of launch vehicle capability though today uh, we do go for our communication satellites to launch abroad in terms of satellites uh, we are uh, one of the success story we have uh, you can say world's best operational capability in uh, remote sensing satellites we have a imaging capability from 1 meter to 1 kilometer resolution uh, multi spectral and all that including uh, touching microwaves and that type of radar in terms of uh, communication satellites uh, we are uh, having 13 operations communication satellites and we go all the way from s band to k u band and k band there are some transponders in k band also so we have a good capability we are able to have a unfurlable antenna which recently launched 6 and 1/2 meter which can give wonderful applications when it comes to approaching uh, very small handheld terminals that technology is under evolution now and in terms of uh, navigation satellites uh, we are one of the emerging as one of the leaders because we are the only people in the world who conceived a regional navigation system we didn't want to put 28 satellites or so and uh, we, we have this now five satellites up and with another two will have the completely operational regional navigation system which will be able to give you location accuracy of something like uh, around 10 to 15 meters without any augmentation 
and if you augment we also have a capability uh, of augmenting through gagan is a augmentation through the uh, ground support where we really look at the availability we look at the at atmospheric corrections and we also look at the jitter of the clock correct for that and once we do that we are able to provide the capability in the aircraft to land in totally blind mode under uh, science we have these two important missions now the or mars orbiter mission as well as the astrosat is a new laboratory in the space at a first you can say we can call it laboratory because it gives you multi spectral uh, observation of the stars starting from uh, up uv hard x ray soft x ray and other spectrums various applications uh, which uh, space has been uh, doing i will not elaborate much except name them because these things have been talked about for over decades uh, like in agriculture today we have a ability to map the complete crop at the seven major crops we are able to tell the map how they are growing and what will the yield going to be and uh, we are able to give a meteorology advices uh, with respect to weather what where and what should be done by the farmer this gap technology actually uh, the space and the meteorology have done well in terms of linking together on drinking water there is a particularly in areas like rajasthan there is a very successful mission where we can identify the locations for having the bore wells pfz is a uh, potential fishery zone is a area where ministry of science and uh, the isro have worked together and uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, you can say application about Two lakh fishermen are getting advice about where to go and fish. It's a very highly potential because uh, estimate by an independent agency has said that this application saves fifty thousand crore worth of diesel in a year. Uh, it's a looks mind-boggling number, but that's what the report says. Watershed development has been going on in mostly all states. Uh, monitoring of the irrigation infrastructure and uh, of course uh, there is a capability to have the um, census of the natural uh, resources like uh, every once in two years forest monitoring is done uh, its status and whether it's come down or gone up or that uh, inventory is kept assessment of uh, forest cover is done uh, decentralized planning panchayat in all that so i think we'll leave it and go to the satellite navigation uh, this constellation as i said we already have five satellites now and we are able to achieve a position accuracy of 10 meters so it's more or less as good as uh, gps or other constellations like lonos etc with the this is not operational yet fully but the once is operational because last satellite was launched only about less than a month back but once it is operational then it will give us the strategic advantage in the sense that uh, when there is a need it's likely that gps may not be available and uh, that gap will be filled by the irnss is a indian regional navigation system gagan is a update on gps signals and as i said we are today able to uh, this the air card which are equipped with this gagan receiver augmented receiver then we are able to meet the requirement of the cat 3 uh, landing which gives there is a number for that i think the vertical is about uh, 6 meters and lateral is about 2 meters we are able to meet that so uh, landing in delhi in fog should not be a problem anymore under planetary science uh, as i said we have really these two major missions moms and astrosat but uh, so far we have uh, this is what we have done but then what is uh, 
can be done in the future. In terms of energy and infrastructure, uh, we have, uh, we can do a instrument called uh, GPR. Is a radar which can be is ground, ground penetrating radar. It can actually reveal the uh, surface beneath, beneath below the earth and can give you geological structure mapping. It's possible we have not done that. There's one area on. Uh, Magnetic anomaly mapping, we have really not done much area. It can be a lot of activity revealed, particularly hydrocarbons exploration. We have today multispectral capability, but uh, uh, we need to go better than one meter. In fact, the next plan, ISRO has planned, is uh, 35 centimeter uh, multispectral. This is something which should be coming up in the future. That will reveal a lot of new other applications. And uh, it's possible to have a complete map, quicker map, of high, with high resolution winds over land as well as coastal regions. Now, that's something which is very important in terms of the um, calamities or disasters as, as well as uh, the coastal region mapping. On weather and climate, we need to have the uh, vertical profile measurements using LIDAR and radar with the onboard space is, uh, spacecraft. And once we do that, then we'll have a tremendous improvement in other uh, weather capability, weather forecast capability. Uh, over the last uh, 10 years, you must have seen that uh, there's enormous improvement already. That's because of the modernization. When I took over as the secretary and started organizing the Ministry for Sciences, there was a joke in Delhi that if the IMD says that you there's a rain, then you better not carry an umbrella because then it will not rain. But I think the perception has changed now. Today, if IMD says there's rain in Delhi or rain in Bangalore, you better carry an umbrella. So that. But that is not sufficient. We need to do a lot more. Our uh, long-term forecast is not as good. As well as in short term, we need to be doing, in, in fact, what you call is a now casting. We should be able to say in four years, in four hours, what will happen at Nias. It may rain at Nias, it may not rain at uh, Malaysia from Fifth Cross. And that much ability we should be able to have. Once we have systems like radar and LIDAR in the spacecraft, it will create a... Of course, it can be fulfilled by putting a Doppler weather radar over Bangalore, but then it's very local. If you are bound to serve a larger region, then we have to put LIDAR and radar on satellites. There is a lot we can do with this kind of radars on the climate, uh, on the cloud macrophysics, because that's something which we need to understand. We still don't have the complete understanding. We know a uh, lot about clouds, but how the clouds precipitates at the physical phenomena meddling, we need to do a lot more work. Because it's possible to have a lightning sensors on geo platforms. We have not done that. If you do that, that will be a, again great enabler in many ways, including warnings. And you don't have to wait for the lightning to strike uh, a transformer. Probably we can save those things. And also the highly spatial resolution of uh, with the wind, surface winds, both, both on uh, land as well as on the ocean. This can be done using uh, various kind of uh, wind profilers uh, in the satellite. On the early warning system, we have uh, we can have a very good uh, soil moisture and uh, uh, mapping at very high resolution. And if we have that, then we can really uh, see how the drought is developing and how the Soil will take it suddenly this slush of water, whether it will flood or the water moisture will, or the, or the soil will absorb or not. So we need to have, uh, for this particular applications, we need to have the L-band uh, SAR in the, on the satellite. There are uh, sensors, uh, satellite-based sensor for uh, measuring the precipitation quantitatively. 
And once we have that, then we can have a much better understanding of the landslide forecast as well as the flash floods. These are real problems. You know, what happens in Uttarakhand was really a flash flood. And landslide happens very often. And we have no understanding of that yet. In fact, we were working uh, on a, in a, in a what is the future system. And it's possible that if you have uh, two, a constellation of two synthetic aperture dark cave and satellites, then you can get a slope measurement with an accuracy of a uh, few centimeters. And then you, with that, we can have a very good map of the slope, and that will help you, uh, help us in uh, landslide as well as the avalanches. That's something much more important because avalanches take a lot of lives in the country particularly in the region where our soldiers have to um, live and uh, do operations, avalanches have a really big, big concern. We need to have a uh, high-resolution bathymetry and uh, digital elevation modeling. This is something very important, particularly for the surges, storm surges as well as the tsunami, if we have to prepare ourselves for that. I mentioned about synthetic aperture radar based uh, interferometry based on two or three satellites in a constellation. And that is a must for us to have uh, from these natural disasters if you want to warn sufficiently advanced. Establishment of uh, river gauges uh, for, and with the satellite connectivity. And this is mostly, of course, satellite role is for connectivity like communication, but we need to have this application. Under uh, communication, we are having, as I said, we have Gagan, is basically large area augmentation system. Uh, and, uh, but we need to provide this capability over wide range and uh, uh, to, actually today the space segment is uh, reasonably well established, but we need to do a lot on the ground. Delhi is not the whole country. We just have focusing on Delhi. Development of the uh, mobile satellite systems uh, is something very important with multi beams. If we have that, particularly in S band, then we can have a very good communication capability through the ocean. Uh, today, our oceans have absolutely uh, no coverage at all. We need to have uh, satellite communication terminals, very small ones, handheld, for disaster management. We, the first thing that goes as a casualty in our uh, system as the communication system uh, in any disaster, whether it's an earthquake or a landslide or a surge, storm surge or a tsunami, for example. So even the heavy deluge, uh, the first thing that suffers is the communication system. So we need to have a satellite-based uh, compact communication system which will, of course, require uh, new technology like uh, beam forming and uh, multiple beam satellites, your dynamic power allocation, etc. The most important thing is that we have been so far thinking satellite and space as an identity by itself. We need to integrate with the terrestrial networks. Now, that's something, uh, because uh, this is a question of now domain, who should do it? Now we have to resolve these issues, but essentially the time has come, we have done well in space, but unless we really link or provide this uh, networking, we are not going to go further. Without the capability in the country, our defense applications are uh, very, very poor. We actually have not got a defense applications really in place. Uh, throughout the world, the uh, Defense drives the space, except in India. India is the, I'm not finding fault with that. It's uh, perfectly okay. But in India, we started with Sarabhai's vision that space for the people. And that was a great vision. But the security is an important issue. And space plays a very important role. And it's not just during the war time. Is where it plays much more role before the war time. So the electronics intelligence, where you need uh, many constellations of uh, satellites. Uh, in fact, more than constellations is the formation flying. 
uh, if I want to locate a radar in the enemy territory, we are doing some project now. Uh, one project is running with ISRO and DRDO, Cotelia, in which we are putting in one uh, satellite this capability. But again, our resolution will be poor because but one satellite, we can have a maximum of something like uh, around one degree uh, capability and one degree capability along the horizon becomes very poor. Uh, it becomes a few hundred kilometers, uh, so we need to do a lot of reiterations. There are methods of overcoming that. We are working on those signal processing things, but it's uh, uh, we have to ultimately get back to the formation flying, which should happen fast. Without that, we have uh, really no alien capability. Uh, for example, China has got a uh, three constellations of the alien satellites, three formation flying. I think each one of them is around four satellites. So we have to go a long way in uh, Alint. In uh, communication intelligence, we have actually done nothing. Uh, in fact, today we have got a very good capability on ground. When you really see that, uh, you hear in the TV, okay, there are the terrorists talking and this talking and that talking, and we have got reliable sources, information, and all that. Uh, that okay, there's a terrorist uh, going to be attacked or going to be in Delhi or somewhere else or Lal Kila. All that when you hear is purely equipment based communication intelligence, but all our communication is on ground. We have done well in that area, but now the time has come that we take that equipment to the satellite. Now, there are limitations because satellite, uh, you can't do this from the geostationary satellite. And if you are not putting geostationary satellite, you have to put on the uh, low orbiting satellite, then you have time gaps. So there are issues, but we need to overcome that. We have to find solutions with respect to the Leo constellations as well as the Mio constellations. But we, this is something we need to address. A very uh, important technology emerging is hyperspectral monitoring or mapping. Uh, typically, uh, you divide the spectrum from uh, uh, optical to near IR and far IR and uh, divide into something like 256 or 512 uh, narrow bands. Each band typically 8 to 10 nanometer. And then see the, uh, you have to do a learning. Uh, you know, basically, we are able to generate millions of colors from basically three colors. And you imagine that if the three colors become 256 colors or 512 colors, then what the number of combinations will be? It will be trillions and trillions of combinations. So it is not possible for any computer or anyone to really do it in a uh, very systematic, uh, arithmetic way. You have to do a backward learning. Backward learning in the sense you need to create a target, you need to create a scene and then see in what spectrum we are seeing. But uh, this is a technology <coughs> where maximum effort has gone by Americans. I remember to have seen a paper between 2001 to 2010. They were spending approximately $2 billion in, uh, human, in, in this kind of intelligence interpretations and all that, particularly when they were looking at uh, uh, explosive activity on uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. In fact, that's the only uh, technology where you are able to see the uh, intelligent explosive devices which have been buried under the ground. So, and uh, you can see through the camouflage of any type. But again, it's a, it requires a enormous manpower and effort to really decode those informations. Missile defense is another area we have, I would say we have developed the capability, but we are nowhere near operational. See, uh, I remember a very interesting uh, statement someone made that uh, just because uh, I know reading, if I don't read books, it is of no use to me. I am as good as uh, a person who is illiterate. So similarly, we have developed the capability of interception. But making it operational is a very different thing. When I'm testing, okay, whether I'm able to hit a coming missile or not, I'm simulating, I know when the missile is coming. But in real life, the enemy doesn't tell me when the missile is coming. 
he does it at his own sweet uh, time of his choice or his choosing so to do that you need to create sensors in a space and for this particular thing you need uh, geosynchronous satellites monitoring continuously technology is available we have not done that but technology is possible it's not impossible but then we need to do a large level of integration of satellite capability with the ground capability and we, everything has to be automated if you're talking of a missile defense there cannot be a man in the loop it has to be all computers so a lot has to be done in this area then we are talking about today's tomorrow's flight where or tomorrow's fight or tomorrow's war where the soldier will become as a total system in fact if you really see some of the magazines like gens weekly you will find that american soldiers carries as much as something like uh, 30 to 40 kg of weight i don't know how to how does he carry but uh, it's a totally total system and now there's a talk going on that there will be a Uh, mechanically assisted soldiers soldier uh, like you have a um, power uh, steering power steering on the car you just touch it and this moves similarly you will have to just uh, move the lag and rest of the things will be done by mechanically that kind of a cost concepts are coming and the soldier when he walks he has uh, everything with him so that's what the they are calling a soldier is a system now in this solar system the space has a big role to play because he is uncontinuously assisted by a computer somewhere there are at least uh, 100 to 200 sensors on his body and they are communicating continuously to the to the system so you need a large connectivity similarly there is a new concept of war network centric warfare now in network centric warfare there is again very little role for human in the sense that he is uh, he just guides he just decides who is the enemy but rest of the things where you should have a uh, aeroplane or where you should have a bomber where you should have a missile or uh, a particular uh, operation to be done by man all is done by the computer assisted in fact uh, the ncw is going to be a as game changing as internet to the to us today that's happening and situation awareness like uh, if you have you remember uh, operation osama you must have seen that there is a small room in which uh, president uh, obama and uh, that time secretary of state clinton and then the secretary of uh, defense all they were sitting and they were watching in real time what was happening now if you have to happen that the satellites have to have a big role to play so we have really uh, lot to do in this area as i said we have really not uh, come we have not come anywhere near the what we need to be done so coming to the challenges uh, what is really the challenge is that we need to integrate the space with civil applications and defense applications if i have got a disaster warning system and if i am depending on isro to give the inputs for disaster warning system because isro has got the capability for space it won't work if i have got a tsunami warning system and a tsunami warning system when we developed it around 500 seismometers were connected in real time all the time 24 hours 27 hour time uh, to the computers at inquis and that process has gone we started the tsunami warning system in 2007 until today there is not even one hour gap in this communication system it happens automatically and that's why we can say that if there is a tsunami within if there is a earthquake first within 5 minutes we will get a prediction forecast or rather assessment i'm not going for assessment of that uh, earthquake within 5 minutes what is the magnitude where it is at 
our tsunami warning system center. Then within 10 minutes, we will know whether it is likely to cause a tsunami or not. And then various kind of other observations start. It's all automatic. So we need to integrate space with the civil agencies. We have not done that yet. We have to do a lot more in exploring new sciences. For example, GPS occultation. From the signal that GPS transfers and going to the other side of the, uh, through a satellite, through the atmosphere, we are able, people are able to say, at least physics says so, that what is the kind of a uh, atmosphere is passing through, what is the humidity, what is the temperature profile, and many other parameters are able to say that. So there's a lot of new science emerging. I mentioned to you about uh, hyperspectrometer. Data interpretation is uh, very, very difficult and uh, a lot of labor of stars, but we need to go through that. There are uh, new uh, technologies emerging, for example, terahertz. Now what can terahertz do is something uh, phenomenal. For example, if you want to differentiate RDX with your uh, ghee, which we eat, there is no other technology than, than, than terahertz. Otherwise, everything will do flex in. So, terahertz technology can do that. Now, whether we can deploy terahertz from space, no one has done that. We need to do a lot of science in that area. There are a lot of signal processing we need to in the particular in the synthetic aperture data and lesser applications. The nuclear biological particularly nuclear and biological uh, uh, attacks are going to be something very critical for us and we need to provide uh, detection capability based on satellites. Similarly, we have run very little in terms of uh, exploiting potential of small satellites. We have really uh, ignored them so far. There are uh, various types of sensors, nano sensors emerging, particularly based on the uh, biotechnology, uh, which can be put, which can do things, particularly in the context of the NBC. We have a uh, lot of potential in terms of uh, manpower, large manpower. But what we have done is, we have really kept uh, our space as a very closed intact in, inside a dome. We need to demystify space. It's not uh, something very uh, something which people can't understand. We have made an assumption and we need to focus a lot more on formation flying. Well, with this, uh, I'll just end uh, uh, with my conclusion, concluding remarks that India has got a matured space program. And I, with conviction, I can say that we have done very well in relative terms with our very small budget. However, space continues to pose a lot of challenges, both in exploitation, exploration, and applications. We have just touched the tip of the iceberg, and large exploitation is still awaiting. We need to demystify space, and externalize, externalization, we are very much internalized. ISRO means ISRO only. We are not involving the community into the space. We need to do a lot of explanation. Well, thank you very much for patience, and it will be my pleasure to interact with you. I think I've taken about this right time. What do you give it to me? Okay. okay. We're on time. Now, thank you so much. Uh, now, sir, would you prefer uh, no, uh, answer some? Yeah, it's a pleasure. Or, pleasure. Anything. Maybe a decade or so in predicting earthquakes. This is particular relevance to tsunami. Actually, you have uh, you have caught uh, uh, my, on my mistake. I by mistake I use the word uh, for prediction. Earthquake are unpredictable so far, anywhere in the world. 
we are not able to predict earthquake there are uh, lot of studies so called precursors to the earthquake uh, at least there are uh, 10 of them and i don't want to elaborate them right now because that will take uh, another half an hour but uh, all of them are signatures which are based on statistics they work sometime they don't work sometime if the radon radon works at one place it doesn't work elsewhere if uh, emission of a particular uh, low frequency uh, or electromagnetic works at one place it doesn't work elsewhere so there are a lot of studies with respect to uh, earthquake forecast there is one institute in uh, calcutta which has worked on electromagnetic uh, low frequency uh, oscillations in the atmosphere there are also some signs that okay sometimes it does reflect but otherwise earthquake is so by phenomena is not predictable however what we are talking in the context of tsunami warning system is not predictability but finding out if the earthquake has taken place within few minutes we should be able to locate where the earthquake was what was this magnitude if the earthquake is in the ocean then in the ocean of the magnitude is of the order of something like 7 plus then only it can generate tsunami without that it cannot generate within that also there are methods actually there are uh, subduction of different type the plates slip over each other that may not cause the tsunami as much but the plate go like this this causes tsunami much more but there are methods now identifying whether the plates slide it or the plates went upside down there are methods of doing that so all that is being done as a part of tsunami warning system so it actually characterizes whether this uh, earthquake can create a tsunami warning or tsunami or not and if we find that yes there is a potential to create then we really create a fuss and alert and then look for other measurements there are uh, bottom pressure recorders in the ocean for example in india we have put uh, four of them in the uh, bay of bengal and there uh, we are able to measure the bottom pressure recorder is kept at the depth of something like uh, 7 km 5 to 6 km and we are able to see average increase in the height of 1 mm we are able to detect even though there are waves of the order of meters but in the average ocean even if it goes by 1 mm we are able to detect that so we alert those uh, so called bprs the bprs give us the signal and it is finally the bpr that tells us whether the tsunami is coming so uh, we are looking for a forecast of tsunami for example uh, if it happens like what happens in uh, 2004 then we are able to detect today about an hour in advance in uh, our uh, east coast we will be able to tell an hour in advance the tsunami is likely to come yes. now that gives the time so it's not the forecast of the uh, uh, earthquake it's the forecast of the tsunami and that too out of the order of an hour or so so was this existing at that point of time or is the no no it was not existing that's that time we were not uh, we had all forgotten the word tsunami <laughs> this came into existence in 2007 Continent collision. So now it's a, the question is about the interpretation of that satellite data what we are receiving. That this had been going for the last means a, it's a process going six, six centimeter per year Indian plate sliding below the Chinese plate. Have we and ultimately that results in the creation of new weaker zones and the reactivation of the earlier existing zones ultimately leading to the earthquakes or all yeah. those natural disasters or calamities. Have we studied the satellite data of all these years or for the last 10, 20, 30 years so that it helps in planning which are the weaker zones which are prone to that because there is a need to uh, re-demarket the earthquake zones of the country now because now no part of our India is safe. Earlier we used to call it only the Himalayan part is unsafe but now having that Latour earthquake or all that 
So all the weaker zones, even in the peninsular India, they are, they have become the zones of the deformance, uh, devastation. So is there any study going on? In the no, actually, what you say is true, but these studies are going for a long time. Satellite uh, role is very small. Satellite does play a role because of the navigation uh, satellites, particularly GPS. By long-term integration, we are able to get a resolution of the order of millimeter. We are able to find out the motion of the Earth even to the level of a millimeter. And this is what something has been done. Actually, the complete geology survey of India is really working much more on some of these mappings, those issues. So these things are uh, much in place. Our problem is not, uh, uh, let's say, understanding of the what's happening to the geology. But still, the earthquake remains unpredictable. It doesn't tell us when the earthquake will take place because that happens with respect to stresses. Stresses get developed. See, earthquake is nothing but because of this motion, continuous motion, there are stresses being developed. And suddenly those stresses become beyond the breaking point. And then you have the uh, system breaks or the rocks break. And that's why you have got the uh, earthquake. So earthquake per se is still an unpredictable thing, but what you are saying with respect to the motion geology, that is being a studied, there are a lot of people, a lot of experts on that, working continuously. In planning the future projects or in planning that, that can help, means such studies are going on in the ISRO? Or that's something like that. that's no, ISRO is not the organization, but there are other organizations where this kind of thing is going on, continuously going on. ISRO is not working on this area. Thank you. Please. Um, I am Dr. Nandukumar from Kerala Forest Research Institute. As an advisor to Department of Space, my question is from that angle. Science and technology policy for integrating space science with other branches of science or application areas. During the last 30, 40 years, tremendous progress has made space technology. But from practical point of view, we have immense challenges um, and the uh, grassroot level, problems, uh, resource monitoring, health monitoring, um, or disaster management, everything. So integrating space science with other science and technology or other areas, what are the thrust? Uh, um, because uh, Department of Space was always lucky to get more funds, everything, thanks to people like Vikram Sarabhai. So, what could be the possible pathways you will advise to Department of Space for integrating with other branches? You know, if you have heard my talk, first I mentioned about what space is about. And then uh, I focus, actually that was more of a passing. Then I focus what needs to be then the challenges. So. Yeah, this slide onward, it was all about what needs to be done. I have only glanced over what is being done. And what is being done is fantastic, no doubt about it. But there's a lot more to be done. So this slide onwards, I have been talking only about what is not being done, what one now needs to be done. So maybe uh, I don't mind you taking these copies here and having a look at it. Yeah, I agree. I, agree. I agree, sir. But the thing is that areas like education, particularly in the education sector, of course we have high level institutions, but at the grassroots level, space science is yet to percolate to the grassroots level. Similarly for all departments, even for, for example, let us take forestry. Forestry is an important area where applications are there, but it is still in the nascent stage. Let's come back to one issue because the other way you said education. Space is not a solution for education. In fact, uh, I remember when I was director of Isaac, a very famous scientist came to me, the uh, originator of the uh, uh, our radio telescope, and he said, "Look, Dr. Goel, why are you not getting into education? Why do uh, education is very bad shape? So you should start doing." I said, "We are not education department. We are space department." So education, uh, part, let us leave it to educationists. I don't think ISRO should get into that. But you're referring about the forest now. Let's come back to this. In forest, today we have a capability, not only capability, operational system, 
which actually monitors the forest, its growth, its shrinkage and all that, and based on satellite data alone, every two years, a complete invent inventory of the forest is given to the government. That this is the area where the forest is, uh, there's an intrusion, this is the area where the forest has grown. There's a lot of area where the forest has grown also in the last 10 years. So all that is being done today, today being to, uh, with the satellite. Now, your point is well taken. I have said that earlier in my talk. What is missing? Department of Space is this, or ISRO, we are actually giving some of these inputs to the government. We are not linking ourselves with the uh, delivery system where it should happen at the, let's say, village level or the level. This is something we need to do. That information going to the uh, government what government does with that, well, it, it, it does go into the planning, it does go into the policy, but it does not get into the implementation. So we need to close that link. Whether I gave the example of tsunami warning system only from the point of view that we have not just done tsunami warning system as a science. We Sir. have created a tsunami warning system as an operation system. Now this kind of an operation system has to go for a lot more services to the people. And this is what I said it has to be done. But the thing is that the message of telling the people that it is a powerful tool for them to use, that is still lacking. No, no, no. We don't need to tell people it is a powerful tool. We need to give them solutions. It doesn't help because then you are talking, talking to someone else to come in with the gap. We need to bridge the gap in terms of implementation. There is a lot to be done on that area. Okay. Uh, sir, in your presentation, you talked about high-resolution near-shore bathymetry, that is uh, regarding uh, bathymetry near the coastal region. As far as infrastructure, coastal infrastructure development is concerned, uh, we at I'm Ranganath uh, working in Central Water and Power Research Station. We uh, do conduct a uh, uh, lot of uh, projects on coastal infrastructure development. That is, uh, we need basic uh, input data is uh, bathymetry. So for that, we collect data or we <coughs> assign it to a particular agency for collecting the near shore bathymetry and uh, through satellite whatever uh, near shore bathymetry data we are getting how far it is uh, reliable and accuracy if it is uh, very accurate then we need not go for uh, <coughs> collecting data from uh, uh, fr from the land side and it will be that uh, cost will be saved so uh, can you please uh, throw light on this? See, on these things, there are no simple solutions. You look at the coastal region itself, what will be applicable for West Coast will not be applicable for East Coast. What will be applicable for, uh, let's say, Cochin will not be applicable for Bombay. The water quality itself, the kind of uh, uh, pollutants we are introducing, that will self affect our bathymetry data from space. Because space, when I, we are measuring, we are measuring in a multispectral way, uh, like uh, ocean colors, you are familiar with. Ocean, we are able to use uh, bathymetry, but again, it gets corrupted by the uh, uh, the pollutants which you are putting into the sea. A particular river may be much more polluting than the other one. So, it is not just the satellite data alone. There's a lot of ground truthing required. So, this is these are the areas where I uh, we need to work much more in integrating these two. I cannot say today that I just have a satellite, so I'll satellite solve all the problems. No. You need to do a lot of ground truthing. But the difference is when I do the ground truthing, I'll be doing ground truthing only 1% of the area. 99% per of the area, then I can see from the satellite data. But without that 1%, I cannot drive the 99%. So they have to go together. It's not just that I can depend on satellite alone. Okay. okay? Uh, secondly, how about you told, uh, in this it has been mentioned that uh, even wind can be, <coughs> wind intensity of wind also can be identified through satellite imageries and uh, uh, waves are the resultant of uh, wind. Right. So can we have a rough idea about uh, waves also? No, rough so, idea you are already having. See, we have the spectrometer, our own satellite as well as the foreign satellites. That is scatterometer data is being available today and with respect to that the winds are already derived. In fact, if you go to the Inquise website, you can get the complete uh, wave, uh, the, uh, uh, wave information derived from the scatterometer. 
and that information is available to you even today for the complete, uh, you can say, Indian Ocean through the Inquest website. Okay? Thank you, sir. Yeah. <coughs> sir, uh, in your talk, uh, you depicted uh, that how the uh, satellite technologies and defense technologies can be kept together uh, to bring out a good defense system. Uh, in this regard, I want to know that uh, like uh, airspace, we had divided airspace over India, over Pakistan, or over China. Same way that space above that is also divided or it is, uh, it is free for all? The moment you go beyond uh, air, there is no division. The Otherwise, you will be telling, okay, you can't put a satellite here, satellite there. Satellite goes all around. So space is the common heritage of the man mankind. That's right, but then defense system, then if you talking about curbing the two technologies, defense as well as satellite, yeah. then if the satellite is, uh, is, is free to go everywhere, then uh, how we can go for defense? Uh, with the contradiction, with the contra with, there's no contradiction. There's no contradiction. See, just because my house is seen, let's say from a tower, it doesn't mean that my house belongs to the person who owns the tower. They're independent thing, there's no contradiction at all. My house is seen, all right, you can see. Similarly, from space I can see everything, but it doesn't mean that uh, there's a contradiction with respect to ownership. India is India, Pakistan is Pakistan, but my satellite will see India and Pakistan both. So if I have a capability, I can see Pakistan. If Pakistan doubles up capability, they can see India. So it's a, it's a common heritage. Space is a common heritage. Anyone can have a satellite, anyone can have a look at it. So that's how these, uh, these so-called security perceptions have changed. Earlier we were telling that, okay, you cannot photograph in this building, you cannot photograph the airport, it's all stupid today. You, from the satellite, everyone able to save the photographs, so there's no point telling you don't get to photograph this building or this airport. So the perception is changing, but there's no contradiction. Okay. Is that the territory of the war zone, sir? Pardon? Will it not be a danger uh, for when you see the territory of India and Pakistan? Danger for whom? To either side, when we uh, have a common space in the uh, space the is satellite. common. Yeah. Space is common. Space is common heritage. I didn't say common. Space is space. Space is common property. Yes, space is common but property. But on the defense line, will it not be unsafe? Unsafe for who can do? Unsafe for who cannot do? Unsafe, safe for who can do? So this is where the technology comes. You use it. Americans are now telling that they will mine the moon. So if they are able to mine the moon, they will get the resources, uh, they will get helium-3, they will produce more nuclear power. If you can't uh, do that, you also do that. But presently, what is the government uh, looking for to, from the satellite, uh, this one, from ISRO or whatever it may be, on the defense line? What is the government that? looking for? That? We need to do it. I, I, I uh, gave you some of the applications. Sir, I, Those applications add, have to be done. Yeah. I add one point here? Uh, your point is very valid. Uh, that is the reason in the DRDO scenario, we develop uh, anti-aircraft missiles and so on. If anybody, you know, crosses uh, through aerial uh, to our territory, we have a, a anti-aircraft air-to-air missile uh, defense system is there. So automatically we will uh, attack them. No, no, he's not laughing. He's talking about space. In space you have no control. Someone's satellite will come to our space. We have no control on that. That is a, space belongs to the mankind. Space does, once you go above the, above the atmosphere, we don't have a, we cannot say no other satellite will come to over, over us. It will happen. Uh, all of our geostationary satellites, uh, they are used for only communication purposes or some other purposes also there? Uh, I mean, there are only two purposes, communication and meteorology. So, meteorology satellites are all geostationary satellites. Uh, sir, my question is uh, not question actually, but uh, I want to know about uh, use of hyperspectral in case of mineral identification. Because as I am from Geological Survey of India, sir, and uh, what I know is that USGS is already having a elaborate libra library of hyperspectral library of uh, minerals. And we in GSI, we are also doing that same thing, hyperspectral uh, means capturing hyperspectral signatures uh, from aerial surveys and by ground survey also, sir. We take our handheld uh, instrument in the ground and do that. 
So, uh, with this space technology, apart from uh, means capturing wider area through hyperspectrum, uh, is there any uh, more advantage, sir? You see, in case of minerals, particularly what you are asking is true. Hyperspectral has got a lot of advantage. Actually, hyperspectral has got a lot of in many areas. Uh, there are a lot of hundreds of defense applications. Uh, many other civil applications, for example, even in bathymetry, hyperspectral will play a large, large role. Hyperspectral is a very powerful tool, but it requires a lot of learning because, again, you, it depends on how many bands. I don't know how many bands you are working, but today there are systems with uh, uh, 512 bands. And when you take those 512 bands, they are all narrow bands, and you take that uh, weightage of the each. Now, there is no way you can do a sign that, okay, the copper will reflect how is it is. But if there is a copper, if I see in the hyperspectral, then I can see the signature and then try to match again. So basically, there is a lot of ground truthing needed. The Americans have put a lot of efforts in doing their ground truthing. And nor this particular area, they are not actually publishing it. This is something which uh, they see as an intellectual property right because they have put uh, billions of dollars into that. So they don't reveal it. There's no other way except doing it ourselves. So I personally believe, and I, we have been talking, I mean, I'm talking given to input to Israel also, that we need to have a lot more work in the hyperspectral, uh, hyperspectral uh, observations, and then put a lot of people, for example, within uh, GSI, you'll have to put a lot of people to do these studies. How does the data? So first, what you'll do, you will do actually all those locations where you know and then match those signatures, and then see in the country, run other area, where is the signature elsewhere exists. So that you can find out, okay, if the copper is there, these are the signatures. Then you can see whether there is elsewhere in the region. If such a signature comes, then you can say there is a copper likely to be. So this is actually some kind of a learning system. You have to create a learning system, there is no other way. Creating our own library, but uh, as you said, I was not knowing that USGS is uh, keeping that confidential. They will not give this information to anyone. Even the, they are not sharing even their friends. So, and we are not all that friends. So, we have become friendly now, but, yeah. Based on? Okay, the simple answer to a simple question is that there is absolutely no signature, no sign of any extraterrestrial life. People have been working at least for the last 40 years trying to search for an extraterrestrial intelligence or extraterrestrial life. There is absolutely no signature except there is a signature of a bacteria, microbacteria at the level of angstroms or uh, uh, nanometer level. There is a signature of uh, bacteria. There are uh, certain evidences that uh, bacteria can survive in space. But that is a, at the microbacteria level. No, no, microbacteria is able to survive in, even without atmosphere. For example, uh, there is a, uh, another interesting thing. Uh, below the Antarctic, where the thickness of the ice was something like 7 to 8 kilometers, Below that, we are able to get a bacteria. They have never seen the light, they have never seen the atmosphere, but still bacteria is there. So we are able to see the macrobacteria. There is a signature or evidence of microbacteria. But beyond that, so far, thousands of people for years have worked. They have not find, found any signature. All that what you, are, you hear is stories. Not necessary. How we evolved? When we evolved, there was no oxygen. There was mostly methane. We, have, we actually we have, we have evolved from the methane-eating bacteria. That's why methane doesn't cause you poison. You don't die in methane because of uh, methane. You die in methane atmosphere because there is no ex lack of oxygen. So we have evolved through methane. Sir, good morning. Uh, uh, I have uh, a question regarding the application of space technology for defense. Uh, in your uh, slide, you showed um, um, 
for defense application, a uh, lot more needs to be done. We have already made a statement on that. Uh, still, if we think of uh, the inhumane condition of uh, uh, Siachen or any you know international border of uh, uh, India with other neighboring countries, can this uh, space application be used so that we can have minimum manpower today uh, uh, you know, with the help of this space application instead of having so many soldiers with uh, that kind of uh, uh, you know, inhumane condition where we have lost uh, uh, brave soldiers, uh, can this be replaced by to some extent? Uh, with the uh, space technology, with uh, suitable sensors or monitoring or <coughs> whatever. I don't know uh, if you have any uh, comments to make on this. Madam, you have to really see what is the third perception and what a sensor can do. Your point is very right. We can do a lot more work of observing through the sensors. For example, suppose I, I can put today optical sensors there. We have developed a camera system which can monitor the movement of uh, man or cattle and all that. And that camera can alert us what is happening. But then the camera will alert, let's say, five kilometers. If something is coming five kilometers, the camera will say man is coming. But then because it's inaccessible, by the time five kilometer fellow that comes, can you send your men to protect it? See, if you are looking for information as a sensor, space can do a wonderful job because all that can, space can do is connectivity. I can have sensor, space will tell me instantaneously this is happening. But then the job is not end over here. Job is that you have to protect that CHN. For protecting Siachen, I should be able to land my man on Siachen before that fellow reaches there. Now, do we have that capability? There's no way I can put a man in five minutes, by the time that fellow comes five kilometers. For me also, there's an ocean, there's a ice, there's a hilly region. It's much more difficult terrain. So, a helicopter cannot land there at that height. So I, if I can't send a person within, uh, by the time he comes five kilometers, and he also has a helicopter today. So it's a question of when we are fighting a war, we have to really see what we can do by uh, instrument, what we can, for what man is needed. To prevent a man coming there, you need to have a man there. Otherwise, information instantaneously we can get. That's not a problem. But that's not the end of the goal, no. What will I do with the information if I can't send the person before uh, to protect it before he comes? Or, there's a way to do that. Okay, I can put a uh, lot of uh, automatic, I can put a nuclear bomb and explode, but we can't do that. You can't do... Monitoring is no problem. Monitoring is no problem, we can do. I agree with you, monitoring totally, in fact, uh, I'm propagating the complete border, monitoring should be only by instrument. We should not be putting men uh, there and going around uh, the fencing. It is a stupid in today's world. We are still doing it. There's a technology today. You don't need to put a man along the border for finding out whether someone is coming inside or not. Cameras can do their job. And they can be all connected through a satellite. So that can be done. But still, that does not reduce your requirement of keeping the man there. Okay? This concept of this NCW, which you talked about, uh, is it uh, implemented anywhere or it is uh, still in the, uh, uh, in any other country? It's in very advanced stage in U.S. Okay. The uh, NATO is working in this area. There's some thought process going on in India also. Uh, the Navy is uh, trying to work on this, uh, <coughs> Navy as well as the Air Force. But we are in the very beginning phase of the net net network-centric warfare. Okay. Sir. The programs uh, to improve the drought hit areas, can you kindly tell something in terms of either connecting the rivers or cloud seeding, etc.? You see, uh, cloud seeding is a technique which is not proven yet. 
in spite of the fact that for the last uh, 20, 30 years, it's happening in uh, Andhra Pradesh particularly. But uh, there is still a lot of, uh, scientifically there are a lot of doubts, the technique works. All the, uh, all that what has been done, validation exercise has been done, is, is done like this, that you put a arrow and then mark there, okay, my arrow has come here. But it does not mean, uh, I mean, they are, you are putting chemicals into the cloud and then after the rain you see, yeah, yeah, chemical is there, so the cloud rain because of the chemical. So scientifically, the cloud seeding is a very open question. Now, I have dealt with a lot of scientists, so I don't know, I'll elaborate further on that. So cloud seeding, whether the solution or not, is a question mark. I'm not trying to say it is not, but I say that is a question mark. All the cloud seeding has been done in this country is all because of vested interest. It's nothing to do with science. On the linking of the rivers, yes, that's a good potential, but again, whether the solution for drought, I don't know. Uh, that's a very good solution for distribution of the power, of the water. But if the water itself is not there, if there's drought in the whole country, if, the, uh, if you are linking the rivers, yes, if there's imbalance between the water or the rivers, you can do that. If Ganga water is more and Yamuna water is less, you can link and then you can solve that problem. But if the whole drought is there, see, if you really see Himalayan uh, rivers, you forget. But if you see the southern peninsula, they are not uh, uh, perennial rivers. If there's a drought, whole region, there's a drought. So then what do you do? But drought will solve, but the in, river in linking will, interlinking will solve many problems. I'm not very uh, comfortable to say that it will solve all the problems, particularly drought. Yeah. Dr. You give me one example. You give me one example. Because many times, what you say, NASA, these are local papers, they create a lot of uh, hype. It's not necessarily nothing to do with NASA. So, that most of the time, there are just noises being created because you see nowadays, you see TV anchors. For a small thing, they will make such a big news and then go on talking whole day. If this small boy gets into the ocean, uh, some borehole, that becomes uh, whole international news for next 24 hours. No, whether that's to become or not, I don't know which one you're referring to. NASA normally doesn't get into this kind of a things. So this must be a local creation. Unless you give me an example, I can't comment on that. Okay, so I'm not able to, uh, I'm not uh, his question, but question is... is uh, something the end of the year, the beginning of the year, there was predicted that uh, for, uh, some days it will be completely down and uh, for uh, from the weather. There was no forecast or prediction from NASA. This must be some local news channel which is creating in the name of NASA. Okay. It has some years back that yeah. uh, the end of the year, no, 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 no. There was nothing like that. I read quite a lot about uh, what NASA says. This must be some your local... Uh... One last question. Uh, sir, regarding the stack, uh, the stack is in Vigal Gates, uh, When I put that this has to be done, means it has not been done. <laughs> okay. Okay. If no further questions, uh, let us uh, give a big applause to Dr. P. S. Goyal. For giving Thank you. Talk. May I now request Dr. Surinarayana to propose vote of thanks. Dr. Surinarayana, please. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, it's my uh, great privilege and honor 
to give a word of thanks to P.S. Goyal for his excellent presentation on science, technology and space. His uh, main focus is on application and challenges. He initiated his talk uh, mainly uh, when the Indian space program is initiated, it's nearly 1960 and all. And what are the launching vehicles India we have, uh, right from the oh. like uh, LEO, SSO, GTO, SLV-3, ASLV, PSLV, GSLV and so on and their capability. And also is specified its stock on type of satellites, it's like you no know, communication satellite, remote sensing, navigation, space science, satellites and their applications. So his uh, talk mainly uh, focused on uh, applications, particularly like uh, satellite navigation and civil space applications, uh, like uh, it, how it, this uh, satellite and space are uh, useful for like you know, early warming, I mean warning of the systems like you know, natural uh, disasters. Uh, how it will be useful the communication and also uh, the applications of this space and satellite in defense applications and their limitations what we uh, we have to do in near future and also uh, is last phase in challenges so what challenges we have so what type of work uh, we need to do in future to utilize the space and satellites in terms of you uh, know GPS and other uh, these things. So uh, I hope this discussion is fruitful with a lot of uh, emphasis and the hopes for future. Uh, definitely I hope it will help and think uh, for future and possible uh, uh, directions to work on uh, in space and the satellites. With this uh, on behalf of, behalf of DST and NIAS training team on my own behalf. I thank Dr. Goel for his excellent and uh, fruitful uh, presentation on science, technology and space. I thank you.